It is, it is September 8th, 2013. My name is David Quick. I'm here interviewing Richard Sinerkia for the DC Gardeners Oral History Project, which is sponsored by the Neighborhood Farm Initiative and the DC Humanities Council. Richard, thank you for sitting and talking with me. You're welcome. Yes. Can I get you to start just by saying your name and your address? My name is Richard Sinerkia. I live at 1351 Otis Street, Northeast, Great. Washington, DC. Okay. Um, could you start just talking a little bit by, about your early life, where you grew up, your family, neighborhood, things like that? I grew up in Woodridge, New Jersey, which is like uh, halfway from Rutherford to Hackensack, if you know anything about northern Jersey. And it's just a little uh, bedroom community for New York. It's all like the neighborhood I grew up in was post-war housing. All the houses were identical, and all the families were large, and, you know, we played in the street. It was a, a real 1950s childhood, which I really treasure now, because mm -hmm. um, we, were, we were free to roam wherever we wanted to, and we did. Mm -hmm. uh, we used to climb trees in the woods, and we did things that nowadays you'd be arrested for. I remember when we gathered up all the Christmas trees that people had thrown out after Christmas, and we dragged them to a clearing in the woods, and we piled them up like a dozen Christmas trees, and we set them on fire. Mm -hmm. It was really cool. <laughs> it was a great fire. Uh, but nowadays, can you imagine? We'd all be arrested. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my, our parents would put us outside and didn't want us to didn't want to see us again mm -hmm. until the next meal. So it was great. It was terrific. Um, and I went to public school for grade school. I went to Catholic school for high school. And the Catholic school is like ten miles away, so we rode a bus. Had your family been? In New Jersey for my a long time? grandparents were all immigrants. My my mother's parents immigrated from Ireland. My parents' parents immigrated from Italy, and so my parents were first generation Americans. And in their generation, what you wanted to do was to assimilate. In fact, I was told my name was Sinertia, and my brothers and my sister say Sinertia to this day, and all of their kids. I changed it back to Sinerchia because I like to be a pain in the ass, and because it, that's how an Italian would say it. I thought, well, it's an Italian name, let's pronounce it the right way. So, uh, but I'm the only one in the family who says that. I mean, my branch of the family is. They're all up in the New York, New Jersey area. They didn't go too far from home. Mm -hmm. uh, and I had another brother who died in 1978, who's older than me. I'm the second oldest in the family. Okay. So, uh, after high school, I came down here to go to Catholic University, and I met my wife, and we found a house in the neighborhood, and so here we are. Okay. Were, uh, since the, the theme of this interview is gardening, did you grow up growing food? Were your parents gardeners? My father used to put in a few tomato plants, but and he had raspberries in the backyard, and I don't remember too much more. It wasn't a big thing him really, although his father had gardens out behind their place in Bayonne, and we would go visit them. I know that Grandpa had gardens out there. Mm -hmm. And I remember that one year my dad brought home this pear tree and planted it in our front yard. And the story that I remember is that my grandfather had grafted three kinds of pears onto this one pear tree. And I remember there were different kinds of pears growing on mm -hmm. that pear tree. And that was there for a few years, I guess, probably more than a few now that I think of it. And one day we came home from our vacation at the Jersey Shore, and the tree had fallen over dead, and it was lying in the front yard, and that was the end of that. So, you know, he, you know, my dad did a little gardening, but I wouldn't say he was like a big gardener. Okay. I know his, his uncle, his name, that he was named after, my father's name was Augie. Mm-hmm. At which I just don't hear anymore, you know? It's Augustine? Or August. August. Uh, well, Augustine, yeah, it was Augustino, actually, but Augustino. Um, everybody called him August or Augie. Mm -hmm. I think he used the anglicized version himself, but I think his birth certificate said Augustino. His uncle, Augie, had some property in the country somewhere, and I remember going out there, and there was stuff growing everywhere. Yeah, mm -hmm. He was a big gardener. Uh, but I got into gardening because my wife was interested in gardening. Even before we married, she was gardening a little bit at her house. She grew up here in the neighborhood. She was a Brooklyn girl through and through. She was 
born in D.C. and in this neighborhood. She lived in this neighborhood her whole life. And she wanted to get into gardening. We were reading organic gardening magazines and stuff. So we started gardening in her backyard, which was 1014 Monroe Street. And I don't know how we did it because it's like it was a lot of shade back there. I don't know what it's like there now, but I remember being a lot of shade. But we tried, and we had compost, mm -hmm. and we were just learning how to do this then. And I, I knew nothing. I was just like an extra pair of hands <laughs> to help turn the ground over, really, is what I was. This was while you were still in college, or after? I guess it must have... I, I was in college from 67 to 71. I met her 68, maybe. She was in high school, but after the riots in 68, she and her sister had been sent to finish high school with relatives in Pennsylvania because it just wasn't that safe. And her sister went to public school here, uh -huh. and uh, the family didn't think it was safe. So they sent the girls away, and, and so her mother went to the empty rooms to college students. So then, of course, I don't think she thought this whole thing through because at the end of the school year, the girls came home, mm -hmm. and we were still there. Mm -hmm. So they had to work that out. But that's how I met her, <laughs> anyway, in her own family home where I was renting a room. So we started gardening uh, in her backyard because she was into it. And I, like I said, I had really, I didn't care. I was not sure why not. Let's go yeah. plant something. Um, and as I recall, when there was a time there when we didn't live in Brooklyn. We were living in apartments before we bought our house or before we moved into our house. Um, our house was needed like three years of work by me on the weekends before we could even move into it. It was, um, it was really, um, it was a mess. Had someone been living in it? Well, you know, um, it's a historic house, really. It's been, uh, the Diggs family uh, lived there. They raised eight kids. My next door neighbor, Tommy Diggs, just died at the age of almost 91 two weeks ago. He, he lived next door to me. His father basic built most of the house. From a, it started out with some little farm building or something, and he finished it. And then, when his mother died, the house sat empty for eight years. The family couldn't agree with on what to do about it. There was no will, and it was getting vandalized. And the whole place was overgrown with weeds, and they wanted to get rid of it. So they sold it to us for like a sum in the four digits. Mm -hmm. You know. <laughs> now at the time. You could buy a house like this right here, let's say, for maybe $25,000. Yeah. But this was pretty amazing. Yeah. So we couldn't say no, right? So we yeah. scraped together the money to buy the house. But then we found out how much trouble we were in with what condition it was in. So I realized that my whole life was going right into this house. And it did, basically. But one, when we moved in there, we started gardening again. We'd been living in apartments in PG County yeah. uh, where we couldn't really garden. Um, but we gardened here. At the, and in the garden, in, and I... She was a much more avid gardener and, and landscaper. She was the one who planted all the flowers and the bushes and things like that. I was more into vegetable gardening. I remember at some point she said to me, because she was doing most of the gardening herself, because I was working. She did not work outside the home where we raised a big family. Yeah. And so it didn't make it didn't even make economic sense for her to work outside the home. Besides which, all her interests were in home type things, cooking and and you know fixing the house up and all that stuff. So she said to me, look, why don't you do the vegetable garden and I'll do the flower garden? Mm -hmm. Which seemed like a great idea until I realized she wasn't going to leave me alone out there. She, like, I'd be out in my vegetable garden having things just the way I wanted them. And she'd come out and say, oh, you can't plant that there. <laughs> I said, sure I can. <laughs> she said, no, no, you really can't. Or she, I think we should turn the bed so they run north-south instead of east-west. And I'm like, we just changed them from north-south and now you're, you know. Stuff like that. So, and I forget. Did you say she had been pretty knowledgeable before you started? No, she just learned everything as she went. She and I both really uh, were autodidacts. We didn't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we didn't really study things systematically. It's just you know you had a problem, you solved it by looking it up somewhere, which is one reason why I have so many gardening reference books in the house, mm -hmm. frankly. Um, and we bought books or or found books about everything that we needed to know. I mean, I fixing the house up, I had to learn all the building trades mm -hmm. myself. Because, you know, as a musician, I didn't have any money mm -hmm. to pay anyone to do anything. So everything had to be done by us. Yeah. So, you know, the concrete work and the carpentry and the electricity and the plumbing and all that, I just 
and learned how to do it and did it. And some didn't turn out that well, and some of it did. So, you know, <laughs> it's like you can't. Uh, um, what are you going to do? You know, you realize you're, as an amateur, you're, everything isn't going to yeah. be that. So, but, um, but in terms of the garden, we just taught ourselves and talked to other gardeners and things. Right now, I've been neglecting the flower gardens, far partly because it's just overwhelming, and partly because I, you know, I really don't know what's going on out there. So there, if yeah. we go over there, you'll see they're completely overgrown with weeds, and it's kind of a big mess. But she had like she had a lot of roses. She had some unusual things. She had this uh, acanthus plant. Mm -hmm. It's really cool. They flowered last year for the first time, and I'm like, what the hell is that? I had to look it up. I didn't know what it was. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a gigantic camellia right in front of the house which she <laughs> we were at the National Arboretum one day and she found, saw this camellia seedling in their trash and they don't, they don't let you take things away but she said well they threw it out it's trash so she, she you know, pocketed it and brought it home and it was about six inches tall for seemed years to me and every time I walked on that hill she'd be saying don't step on the camellia don't step on it I don't walk and that twig and now it's like 10 or 12 feet high and it's, it covers the whole front of the house. It's actually a problem now <laughs> because you can't even see the house from the street. And, you know, it's like, whoa, is there a house back there? Yeah. But it's um, when it blooms and it blooms in the spring. Yeah. It's really just beautiful, covered with blossoms. Yeah. Um, but so she did stuff like that. And, I, you know, we've tried all the usual things that people grow in vegetable gardens. And then we got into, uh, we planted an asparagus patch, which was a great thing to do. And anybody who's going to be staying in one place for like five years, they really should do this because it's so cool to be able to get your own asparagus. And asparagus is usually expensive yeah. and not that fresh. Yeah. But to pick your own asparagus, is, it's very rewarding. It's perennial, so it's it just, just there. comes back, yeah. Yeah. Although, there's an interesting story about the asparagus patch because one year it developed a problem and I was getting these shriveled, shrunken, sad looking asparagus spears. And I looked up online what's going on with the asparagus. Well, it's some sort of wilt problem. It's a fungus. Mm -hmm. It gets in the soil and the, all the in information I had says nothing you can do about it. Just abandon the patch and plant it again, preferably 50 feet away. And I thought, well, there was no way I'm moving it 50 feet, number one. Number two, I said, this can't be the whole story. So I did some research online, and I found in some university uh, publications, and by the way, the like, papers that the universities put out are a terrific source of information. And so there's one that said, there's nothing we can do about this, and it's a big problem, particularly in certain states like New Jersey. People are just abandoning this land they used to grow asparagus on. And they said, it used to be treated with the application of salt, sodium chloride. But that was abandoned in the 1940s in favor of pesticides, modern methods. And then it went on to admit that there was no pesticide that was effective against it. Right. So I'm thinking, why did they abandon the salt? So I did a little more research and I found this discussion of the salt that told you what the spreading rate would be. And it worked out in my case to about a pound of salt for the patch that I had. So, feeling like a madman, because I'm, you know, I'm putting salt on my garden. Salting the earth. You know, I'm thinking the Romans salted Carthage <laughs> as the final insult after they destroyed the city. Um, and it helped. It didn't cure it. Mm -hmm. And every year since then, and this is maybe six or seven years now, when it comes up in the spring, if I see signs of this wilt, I'll go get a pound of salt and sprinkle it on the bed and, and water it in. And then the problem goes away. Huh. It's the damnedest thing. Wow. One year I said, you know, I've been putting salt on that garden for several years now. I wonder if the soil is, if it's building up in the soil and, and I'm going to create problems here. So I did a little sort of informal test with a litmus paper. And it wasn't particularly alkaline. Mm -hmm. It was a little bit. Mm -hmm. But of course, that's what the fungus doesn't like. So yeah. that's, what you, that's why you're salting it. So I just feel like, you know, it's one of those like through the looking glass kind of things. Mm -hmm. um, I've been meaning to mention that to somebody, so I'm glad that came up because it's like it just staggers me that there was this cure for this problem and now everyone's ba abandoned the wholesale. Right. And I'm finding it works. At least in a backyard garden it works. Whether it would work in big fields of asparagus, I don't know. Right. But it worked. 
So there you go. Well, maybe now someone will listen to this interview and, <laughs> and try it themselves. <laughs> put it out well, there. Aren't we, aren't we lucky that I found this information that could have been just completely right. lost, right? And was has that often been the way you uh, gathered knowledge and skills for gardening? Was just to wait till you have a problem and then find a solution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. That's that's the way I've done a lot of things. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. But if it is, you know, um, yeah. Um, I guess. I mean, we there are some books that were important to us. There's a book by Nancy Bubel called The Seed Starter's Handbook. And she's based in lower Pennsylvania, so her climate's pretty similar to ours. Mm -hmm. And she's terrific. She talks not only about starting seeds, but about a lot of gardening techniques that are really, really handy. So that's mm -hmm. a great book. Yeah. Um, so when you... Uh, to go back a little bit, when you first moved into Brookland and got this house that you had to fix up, mm -hmm. what was Brookland like at that time? And well, we moved in here in '77, mm -hmm. mostly black, mm -hmm. middle class black. Yeah. Um, uh, there were uh, well, there were never on our street a lot of kids. There was one family two doors down that had a whole house full of kids. Uh, and remember the Marshalls, Anthony? Yeah. And the, my kids all played with them, and they were around our house all the time. But there really weren't a lot of kids. On my street, there were, let me see, there was an old lady who was housebound on the corner. Then there was this family full of kids. Then there was Bob Artiste, my next door neighbor. And there was us. And then Tommy Diggs, whose house, who grew up in my house. Then there was a house full of nuns. <laughs> and then there was this big building that was built for some religious order which was at that time housing the sojourners you know the sojourners mm -hmm. and then there was a couple more houses at the other end of the street I hardly knew the people up there uh, but it was there were always university people to some extent and I guess anytime you're near a college that's going to happen I don't remember a lot of student houses there seem to be more student houses now than there were there then I can't quite remember but then there was like a, a lady behind us was an old white lady um, from Pennsylvania. Next, I don't know who was next door to her. Um, there was a Jamaican guy on Newton Street. Um, so, you know, it was just a mixed bag. But it, I remember noticing one decade that there seemed to be more like young white people around. And we used to joke, you say, who are all the white people moving in there? <laughs> um, and my next neighbor, Tommy Diggs, and I had a conversation about it once and about how the property values were increasing. And he said, yeah, we, we might have to run you out the neighborhood, he said to me. And we both had a good laugh over that. Um, well, I wasn't not sure he wasn't semi-serious, but he was like that kind of guy. But... Um, so now it, it it's really changed a lot. I mean, I see these people all the time: families with kids, strollers. Yeah. You know. Um, but you all chose to live in Brooklyn based on your wife's. Well, she she there. liked Brooklyn. She'd always lived here. The main thing was we found this house. Yeah. And the house was actually affordable, and you know we said to each other, "And there's no way we're ever going to be able to afford to buy a house." Yeah. If we don't take this one, and we just. As far as fixing the house up, I mean, I always used to say I didn't know which end of a hammer to grab hold of when I bought this house, but you just do what you have to do, yeah. you know. I mean, we we really everybody told us not to buy it. Mm -hmm. Well, people, older established people that I knew in the neighborhood, professors that I'd had at Catholic U, they said, "No, don't buy that house. That's way too much trouble. You don't know what you're getting in for." And they were right, <laughs> but you know, somehow you made it work. You made it work. Yeah. yeah. And you had your goal professionally was to be a musician at that point? Yeah, well, let me think. What, you're 77. At that time, well, there was a recession in the 70s. I had had a job as a music director at a church in Virginia about 1975. And, oh, wait, 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 74. Because that's the year Abe was born. I dated a lot of things in my life from what kid was a baby. And, uh, you have seven, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I got it all covered. So at that time, I'd had that job for only like six months, and it was just a disaster. And then I couldn't get a job after that for a while. It was a recession. I ended up working in the furniture business, hmm. um, not selling furniture. I was like, uh, there was a little furniture company on Wisconsin Avenue where I worked, uh, modern furniture place. And 
they finally went out of business. I think Scan Furniture drove them out of business, and I'm not so sure IKEA hasn't driven Scan out of business. I don't know. Is Scan mm. still around? I don't know. But um, so I was in the furniture business for seventy five, seventy six. When we moved in the house in seventy seven, I was still working at Scan. I ended up working at Scan after this place folded. Uh, and then at some point we were in the house where I didn't have to pay rent anymore. Uh, I went back into music. I get, there was something. Let me think what happened. Uh, the Fillmore Resource Center, which is like an arts hub for this Georgetown schools, they needed a music teacher, so I quit my job at Scan and did that. And then I ended up. I always had a church music job all my whole life. I think hmm. up until. I, that ended in 96. So I just pieced together an income from whatever you could do, mainly teaching and, uh, and church music. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, one or two years in a, in a row I taught at the adult education at Catholic U with an evening course in songwriting. Mm-hmm. My degree is in music composition, mm-hmm. actually, which is a useless degree for making <laughs> a living. So, so I ended up being a piano teacher. When I started teaching private piano lessons was in 84, I was at the time, I was working at a Catholic, Catholic grade school, I was their music teacher, and some of the parents asked me if I would teach their kids piano after school, and this just really took off to the point where I quit the day job, as it were, and started teaching every afternoon, and that's what I do now. I'm, I'm, I have maybe 30 students a week, uh, and I go to their homes, because yeah. I didn't have any, they weren't going to come here. Yeah, Brooklyn. I it mean, it's coming up in the world, but back then, and nobody, none of these people over in Chevy Chase or Cleveland Park, they were not coming over here to bring their kid to piano lessons. So I went to them. Yeah, but they loved that because it was one thing that their kid could do that they didn't have to take them somewhere. Yeah, they clicked really well. So I yeah, I've just been doing that ever since. Hmm. Um, so uh, having a talk about piecing your work together you know kind of a different kind of work than a lot of people in dc do which is a very career oriented town yeah and i I, you know my brief experience with working monday friday nine to five as it were was awful i hated it Mm -hmm. and this way i could make my own life make my own schedule i was home every morning because the students were in school yeah so i went out and taught in the afternoon and taught into the evening we would eat dinner when i came home at 8 30 at night that's when we all had dinner and the kids just waited and that was the real big value for my wife was this family dinner thing. Because I used to say, you can feed the kids if they're hungry, just feed them. I'll eat when I come home. She said, no, we're all eating together. And now they're finding out that this is actually like, really important value. It's actually, this increases kids' IQs. Mm-hmm. Why? I don't know. I don't know what the connection there is. But they're saying that there's lots of benefits to kids to sit down and eat a family dinner. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that's what we did. You know, with we never had all seven kids in the house at once. By the time Michael came along, Martha was out of the house. She's the oldest. Mm-hmm. But there were six. So there's eight of us at dinner every night. And, you know, my wife cooked a lot of food over the years. And she was, she didn't cut corners. She cooked everything from scratch. And uh, she was a very good cook. Yeah. So we all really benefited from that. And were you, uh, in, uh, as a food grower, I mean, was part of the purpose actually to save money, to actually supplement save your Save money, but also, I mean, we were gardening organically, too, and organic food is expensive, and it, it's a lot more common. You can find organic food now. Back then, you couldn't even find organic food yeah. in the 70s and yeah. the 80s. Nobody was doing that. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we, and then, like, in the summertime, we hardly bought anything, vegetables, I mean in the store. We bought the meat and starch, but mm-hmm. most everything else that we ate we grew in the garden. And so like in the springtime, you would have the peas and the lettuce and the spinach that would all be, you know, that's what you ate like every night, you know. And then as you moved into the summer, <laughs> you know, you would start getting like the zucchinis and the peppers and eggplants and then the, the tomatoes started to ripen. And, you know, in the fall, we would plant things for the winter time too, like kale and, and stuff that would grow on into the winter time. We grew winter squash a lot of the times too, and we just put them aside and eat yeah. them in the winter time. So very often, we were still eating our own produce 
at the end of winter, when it was time to start gardening again, we were still eating things that we had saved. From not the canning. We never got into canning, mm -hmm. really, not in a big way. Once or twice we made forays into it. But um, it was just amazing to me how much food you could grow for very little money and really very little work. Yeah. You know? It, there's intense times in the spring when you really got to get out there and do a lot of work, you know, every day, an hour or two. But then the summertime comes, you basically got to keep things watered and, you know, and yeah. weeded and pruned. And it doesn't take that long, half an hour a day maybe. And there's tons of food. I mean, we were giving food away, feeding six kids and still giving things away to people. But that's one of the tricky things is figuring out how much to plant. Now, my problem right now is I'm the only one in the house eating vegetables. My, my son-in-law lives with me and he's a, he doesn't eat vegetables. <laughs> he will eat like a, a, a tomato and mozzarella salad, he likes that. But he would not touch a green bean if his life depended on it, <laughs> you know. And uh, so it's just me, and I, I, I've been tr scaling the garden back, at, well, you know. But I just—it's still too much. It's still too much. Yeah. I have five pepper plants. What the hell am I doing with five pepper plants? One person, you know. <laughs> really, one would have been enough. Yeah. Um, and. I, I can never resist planting too many tomatoes, not only because people love it when you give them tomatoes, but because there's so many cool varieties of tomatoes out there, you just say, mm -hmm. oh, I have to have that. And I better get two just in case one of them dies. Mm -hmm. So then you end, I've got like 10 or 12 tomato plants, and I'm only one person. Mm -hmm. Completely overrun by them. You want some vegetables? Uh, I have a lot of vegetables, you, you but I always, I always love getting vegetables too, if they're good ones. Uh, so I, I, that's too much. I've got leeks growing there now which are great because they're usually fairly expensive and they're really trouble free it's not hard to grow leeks yeah uh, and I mean I don't grow things that are always cheap in the store anyway very much things like carrots or I don't grow potatoes well I did grow potatoes this year the plants all died but I haven't dug them up to see if there are any potatoes down there yeah there might be um, you know and then I realized one year I was growing things I don't even like to eat, like radishes. I don't like radishes. Mm -hmm. But I was planted them because, you know, it's so easy and why not grow radishes? And I thought, well, you know what, I'm not growing radishes anymore. I don't yeah. like them anyway. Yeah. Um, I didn't grow chard for the longest time for the same reason, but this year I planted some and uh, I've been enjoying having it. <laughs> but it's, a lot of it gets wasted or neglected because I just can't even keep up with it. Yeah. When you were, I mean, talk about the not being able to get organic food and certainly not cheaply in the 70s right. where did where did your value on growing f food organically at that point come from well we were interested in growing food organically from the day we started gardening mm -hmm. I mean uh, we were subscribing to organic gardening magazine and reading about it and thinking this is cool this is great this is what people should be doing uh, and so it was kind of like a cause at first yeah um, Later on, it just became, well, that's just how we do. Mm -hmm. We grow things organically. I wouldn't even think of putting pesticides on my garden. We even gave up on some of the common organic pesticides. I remember putting BT on squash plants, trying to prevent borers from killing them. And it, I was never that successful with it. But that's a, an organic thing that you can do. But I just gave up on it. What happened, what I do now with this, I plant the squash as early in the spring as I possibly can. The plants die in the middle of the summer, and most years, I didn't do it this year, most years I would then plant them again and get some another crop before they got too cold in the fall, because just trying to deal with the squash vine borers was beyond me. I, I even tried these things they tell you to do about slitting the stems and killing them. It, it just never worked for me. I don't mm -hmm. know why. So I just, you know, sometimes you just do that. You say, okay, they died, so plant yeah. something else. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Were there... Were there other people in Washington, D.C. at that point that you connected to who were talking about organic well, food? Well, glut was a new thing back then. The food co-op in, in, in Mount Rainier? Yeah. Uh, they started up, oh, late 60s, early 70s. And originally it, was not a, it wasn't a retail operation. It was a buying club kind of thing. And we were buying food from them because we were interested in and buying better food than you could get in, in the grocery store. And it was a pretty natural thing to start growing our own food, you know, just as a supplement to that. 
I'm trying to think who else you knew who was gardening. Well, you know, um, my, both of my next door neighbors are older black people, uh, middle class black people. I know on the one side that the, uh, Mrs. Diggs had grown up on a farm or gardening, you know, in, somewhere in the country where they had to garden. Yeah. And the last thing she wanted was to grow vegetables. They were all, that's what they were trying to get away from. To yeah. them, this was country, and yeah. they were city people. Yeah. So they were like against vegetable gardening. Um, Bob Artie's wife, at the time that we knew, we moved into our house. She was a country girl. She had no problem being country. And we let her garden in our backyard because he wouldn't let her grow vegetables in his backyard. And that was just an, I mean, it was a fascinating to me. I said, why aren't these people gardening? They got all the space. What are they growing grass for? You can't do anything with grass. But I didn't understand at the time that for them, this was, would have been like a status problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sure that in the circles they moved in, people would have thought they were, you know, low class country. country yeah. So they didn't want to grow vegetables. Mm -hmm. And we thought it was like, cool, we got property, let's grow food. Mm -hmm. So, I, she, she, yeah, she was no, uh, she, Brenda just did everything the way she always did it in the country, which was not the way we did things, but I don't think she used pesticides, well, she didn't have any money anyway, but she planted okra and tomatoes and I don't remember what all, in our backyard, even before we lived there. Because we bought the house in 1973, we didn't move in until 77, we really needed that much work. And so during those years when it was just sitting there, she asked us, because we would see her, we were over at the house working on it all that. She asked if she could use the garden there, and we said, sure. Yeah. So that was actually the first food that was grown on my property was from her. I don't know about Mr. Diggs' family. That he told me once that they used to have a chicken coop at the back of the property. <laughs> and the dog lived in the chicken coop, for <laughs> obvious reasons, to uh -huh. keep foxes away, I guess. And... Um, so they, if they had chickens, I'm sure they must have grown food back there. But I never, and he's too late to ask him now, he just died. Um, I don't know that they grew vegetables, but I can't imagine they didn't. You know, back in the early 20th century. And Washington, D.C., Brookland was like country. It was country, yeah. So I would imagine they did. They had a sizable amount of property, too. And I found old canning jars in the attic of my house. <laughs> so they must have, right? Yeah. So, yeah. But, um, were your uh, were your children part of the the gardening operation through the years? Were the children part of the gardening operation? Mm, off and on, not particularly. I guess I can't recall any of them being that avidly interested in it. Although now, as an adult, Martha is very interested in gardening. She lives in Ohio, mm -hmm. and organic gardening particularly. Uh, the older boys, you know what we should have done was just okay, come on, we're going to work in the garden and taught them how to take care of things and do stuff like that, but we didn't. Abe's tried growing things in Florida. Florida's climate is so different from here, we were not much used to them. And their soil is very poor, actually. Um, Phil, Phil is a tomato planter too, doesn't he? He lives on Capitol Slope, uh, 16th Street Southeast. Not quite Capitol Hill. Mm -hmm. um, is that the name of the neighborhood? Capital no, no I just, it's just a, just a joke. <laughs> a friend of ours lived down there in the same neighborhood years ago, and that's what she called it, Capitol Slope, not quite Capitol Hill. Although, you know, that's moving out. There. It's, <laughs> it's really a pretty trendy area where they live. That's yeah, why yeah, they yeah. bought there. Um, so, I, I then Phil, Tony's an avid gardener, as you know. Uh, neither one of his younger sisters has expressed much interest in gardening that I know of. Um, and Michael's, he's not about things like the outdoors. <laughs> <laughs> Thoroughly modern indoor kid. Um, but he's only 18, who knows. So I wouldn't say it's really stuck with any of them as much as it has with Martha. Hmm. But she, she takes after her mother in a lot of ways and one of them is this real love of her. She has chickens! Mm -hmm. In within the city limits of Cincinnati, there's two chickens, and uh, they can do that there. Yeah. Um, but I don't know what's going on with them. Um, she was supposed to be coming here. That's why her husband's living with me. He's he's a brewer. Uh -oh. He makes beer for uh, Heavy Seas. Oh. Uh, you can buy their beer. At, yes. Yeah. 
I do, frequently. Yeah. Well, <laughs> think of my son-in-law, Joe. He's the brewmaster there. There's some of those are his recipes that you're drinking there. Um, he's been there a little over a year now. And she is coming. She's not coming. We don't know what's going on there. But um, that's what he's... And he's, you know, if you get him start talking about beer, you're in for a long conversation. Okay. <laughs> so that's... I mean, he's very good at that. I think it's great. Um, he has a couple of th- business degrees. So he, you know... He, he could really run his own brewery. And I think he'd be happier. But anyway, how do we get on Joe Beer? I don't know. Oh, Martha. Martha, Martha is a good cook and, and uh, a good gardener. And mm-hmm. she gets that from her mom. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, it sounds to me like your family and your you and your wife's just kind of philosophy of life and raising a family was pretty country living in the city yeah that's what we did so urban homesteading yeah why did you do that in dc well why did we do it in dc or why it's not like we picked dc after surveying all the cities in the east sure. coast we were already here i mean yeah you already we found this house yeah you already we had no money there. yeah and so what do you do if you have no money you got to do it for yourself right? right just like the pioneers did i mean they made things for themselves because there was no choice yeah we had we had, i had to learn how to do all these trades to fix up my house because it was the most affordable way to do it and gardening you know we just felt like you know what it was partly the influence of the little house on the prairie books yeah which we were reading to our kids we started reading to martha when she was a baby and this was so cool. They they did all these things for themselves, and they you know it was just this love of the land and doing for yourself, and you get caught up in that spirit. Uh-huh. My na- two doors up from us, there's this family of three kids, and she's reading these books to her kids, and they just love them. They're already actually through all the Little House books and on into the, the there's several spin-off books that come after the Little House series for people who couldn't get enough of them, and they're reading those too. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just this this self-sufficiency kind of thing there was a well you know in the 70s self-sufficiency was a huge deal there were those people in connecticut the nearings helen and scott Uh, nearing uh and then there was a guy in england named john seymour who wrote a book called self-sufficiency on five acres and this was what we thought was really cool Mm -hmm. i mean we don't uh, we didn't have five acres but so it was only a limited amount of what we could do but what dawned on me at some point when I was struggling to earn a living was farmers provided everything they could for themselves and for the things they couldn't provide for themselves they had a cash crop yeah and I thought you know I can make a certain amount of money as a music teacher but let's face it it's severely limited there's only so far you can take this concept but by doing that I also had a lot of time not only in the mornings when I was home but in the summertime when I wasn't teaching. So I thought I can look upon my work not as like my career, but just as the cash crop and everything else we gotta figure out a way to get for ourselves, which means secondhand shopping yeah. and fixing things that break instead of replacing them. Yeah. And, you know, um, growing food and all this stuff. We just tried to live a self sufficient life with this cash crop of my um of music. Music, <laughs> and to tell you the truth, this paid off brilliantly. Yeah. I've never really worked full time. Uh-huh. Since, not since the furniture business. And so what I do with my time is I use my time to save money. I mean, somebody famous said a penny saved is a penny earned. If yeah. you don't spend money, then you don't need that much money. And things that you do for yourself, you don't have to pay taxes on. Mm-hmm. So my taxes, you know, my the taxes I paid to the IRS were really very low mm-hmm. because, well, we had a lot of exemptions too, mm-hmm. let's face it. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I didn't make that much money, so I didn't, my tax bill was usually, except, of course, being self-employed. I had to pay like, what's it, like 15% now, self-employment tax. Yeah. Um, I had to pay that. Yeah. And that was by far the biggest amount of money I paid to Uncle Sam. We had a homestead deduction uh, from the district government, which kept my property taxes low. Mm-hmm. You know, and I, I drove old cars, mm-hmm. and, you know, that was always a problem, getting keeping the car running, but, um, you know, somehow we managed to do that. that the, I'm driving a new car, and it's the only new car I've ever bought in my life. Mm-hmm. We finally got to the point where we thought we could afford a new car, and that was partly because it's a new Prius. And I calculated how much money am I saving on gasoline here, getting 50 miles to the gallon. That really 
cuts down the cost of the car a lot over the, you take the long view. Yeah. So um, that seemed to make sense, and we were at a time in our life when we could actually afford to buy a new car, had a good enough credit rate. So I, I don't understand why more people don't think of life this in these terms. You know, find a way to make a certain amount of money, but keep your time free so that you can save money. Yeah. Well, I, in some ways, that's why I asked the question, though, is that I think there's other urban communities where there would be more of that, uh, a network of people doing, who think that way. In D.C., I don't think of as a place where you would have kind of urban homesteaders as, as oh, so you're maybe in other towns, other cities? You'd yeah, I think the Minneapolis's and the, the Portland, Oregon's and the, oh, really? the Seattle's of the world, you, you, there'd it's be a intriguing. whole scene. So I, I'm just curious whether, how that was, having adopted that, that way of living in this city, was that ever was tricky it? or, well, you know, I don't want to use a pejorative word, but like feeling a little out of touch with the well, rest of the city. We, <laughs> we had no problem feeling out of touch. We didn't mind feeling, being, uh -huh. doing things differently at all. It was yeah. never an issue for us. I mean, for one thing, everybody told us not to buy our house, so we went right ahead and bought it. Yeah. And um, we were always like out of step with our culture. We did have seven kids. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, trying to be, you know, well, you know, we didn't have role models. It wasn't like we said, let's live like they do. Yeah. It was just like we were making it up. And mm. I do think that, really, I do think those books actually had a big influence on our imagination. Mm. Um, uh, kind of, when those people went out in the wilderness and built themselves their own home, we certainly weren't going to do that. But, you know, we basically were rebuilding a home around ourselves. My house has no central heat. Mm -hmm. It has a wood stove. That was the only heat. They never had central heat. When we bought it, it had no central heat. And uh, we couldn't afford central heat. So we bought this big old wood stove. And you know what? You can get firewood for free if you work at it. Yeah. So like all, all through the years, if I saw firewood by the side of the road, if I possibly could, I would stop and pick it up. And, you know, I split the wood and stacked it and cut it myself. Uh, and then after a while, friends of mine would call and say, hey, there's a pile of firewood on the curb over on Newton Street. You might want to check that out. Or And... Last year, people brought me firewood. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that's still how your home is heated? Yeah, yeah. It, it is. Well, I'm about to put a central heat into it this year. Okay. Uh, because it has no central heat, we were never able to buy homeowner's insurance. So it's never been insured. Uh -huh. Oh, but the wood heat thing saved us a whole lot of money, too. Yeah. Once in a while, I bought wood. I would, most years, I think I bought like a quart of wood and then supplemented it. But... The past few years, I haven't bought a cord of wood probably in three years. You're welcome. What? You're, You're welcome. welcome, yeah. You were a big help. Well, we did pay you and Mario to cut up Phil Rate's tree. And um, so that wasn't free wood. But we were also doing Phil a favor. It's a big tree. You didn't know Phil, did you? No. Uh, he was a great guy. He lived over on uh, 7th, 8th and Jackson Street. He died last... When did Phil die? Last winter? Uh, he died of cancer. Uh, mm -hmm. He was maybe 66, 65. Uh, but he was another real counterculture. Well, he type. was involved with that. He was part of the inspiration. He, he, he and I, actually it was Phil Ray that got me to take on a lot of the projects at my house. He talked me into them. But he, wasn't he very involved with that community garden from CU? Um, they had that, wasn't that Monroe that? Street, he, he was involved with them. He also, yeah, he got involved in community gardening and, and homesteader type, type things, too. Uh, but way, way a long time ago, uh, the, he, and the, he was involved with the Fine Arts Council at Catholic University, and they decided to plant fruit trees on, on campus. I guess they got permission to do this. I don't know, but he was always planting fruit trees, and then he was going around pruning fruit trees every year. You know, it was just they got this bee in their bonnet. <laughs> They also put a closed circuit TV system all through the Catholic University dormitories back in the, uh, I want to say the 60s. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's now it's, nobody needs it anymore with the right. internet. But um, he was really a, he was a revolutionary kind of guy. Huh. When we bought our house and discovered it had no foundation, I said, oh, that's it, we're selling it, we've got to get out of this deal, this is a nightmare. And I happened to mention it in his presence and he said, I bet you could build a foundation under a house. So I said, the poor man. 
I, I ignored him. And he called me back. He said, I was serious. You know, I think we could do that. And so I said, all right, Phil, I'll look into it. And so that was his inspiration. And he had worked alongside me doing that, too. Did you have to jack it up and put a... <laughs> we did jack it up. Well, we didn't lift it off the ground. Um, I can tell you that whole story if you want. <laughs> that's, a, that's a story. Uh, we built this foundation piecemeal. It was like an interlocking parts that were all held together with reinforcing bars. Uh, we got a permit to do this uh -huh. from the district government. Uh, I found, uh, you know, the government printing office is a huge source of information about everything. And you can go down there to their bookstore on, on North Capitol Street, and uh, we found these incredible books. One of them was uh, about uh, uh, farm buildings. And they talked about this foundation that you could build a low-cost foundation for a farm building. And it, uh, we realized it would work in our situation because you could build it. The, the, there's pillars that go below the frost line, like in our case, every seven feet. And they're connected what's called a grade beam, which is not below the frost line, but that all the weight is transferred from the beam onto these posts that are below the frost line. We went down to the government and they gave us a permit to do this and they sent inspectors out to make sure we were doing it right and blah, 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 blah. So that took a while, yeah. as you might imagine. And we were, um, Phil would do things like he would go to a, some government surplus auction and he bought a big box full of foxhole digging shovels, which we used to dig because part of my, the house is, uh, it's a brick wall. Well, there's an L-shaped brick wall and the other two walls are wood frame construction. And under the brick wall, well, we couldn't lift the brick wall up for sure, so we had to dig down under it. So we were lying on our stomachs in the, in the mud, you know, digging on these things. Um, it was crazy, but it worked. Huh. And then we poured a slab. We had a big truck come and, uh, you know, brought us seven yards of concrete to pour a slab inside the house. Because they had a wood frame, house, wood frame floor, you know, like just wood beams resting right on the dirt. Well, yeah. that didn't last, yeah. needless to say. This is one of the reasons why people told us not to buy this house. <laughs> I think they must have realized. And the house was slipping off of that brick wall. So we did jack it up. We jacked it up. It used to slant, I think, <laughs> over 15 feet. It dropped at least, I think it was 4 inches. And then front to back, over 36 feet, it dropped 6 inches. And we got another guy, a, a relative of my wife's, secured the loan of a, a transit level. So we could actually see, as you went down the house with measurements, how far off it was, and we jacked it. It's still not quite level. But we lifted it up a lot, like two inches, I think, side to side, and even more than that from front to back. And um, so on the, on the, well, it was up on the house jacks, yeah, we were able to dig, like the whole side, the wood frame side, we dug that all out and poured that all at once. But, um, you know, the, under the brick wall is kind of difficult. Hmm. Uh, and then there were termites. We had to treat the termites. I just recently found my permit to buy chlordane to treat the termites. I had to get a permit to buy this stuff. Um, oh, God. And then there was the plumbing and the wiring. The sewer line collapsed right after we moved into the house. So we had to have that replaced. Mm -hmm. um, the fresh water line developed a leak because the foundation that we built settled onto it. We didn't realize at the bottom of one of our pillars there was the uh, pipe. You didn't see it because it maybe we just barely scraped the top of it when we were digging. But after the winter, the foundation settled onto it, cracked it. It was lead anyway. Mm -hmm. So it's just as well. So needless to say, doing all this kind of thing, the idea of growing our own food was like a short step, you know. Yeah. Was, really, mm -hmm. So. Um, Where did you get? Uh, seeds and the other kind of making. So we just bought them from Heckinger or mm -hmm. wherever. You know, we would have been nice to buy organic seed, I suppose, but that was like you couldn't find that in those yeah. days. Some stuff we ordered from seed catalogs, and uh, we ordered some fruit trees, like from Stark Brothers Nursery. There's some pear, a couple of pear trees in the yard that we planted. There was a cherry tree that died. There was an apricot tree that also died. Um, and um, we, we really, we didn't know what we were doing. And we planted the apricot tree near the property line where it grew partly over my next door neighbor's front lawn. This was bad. <laughs> he was not happy about having apricots dropping on his front lawn. Mm -hmm. So um, relations with him were rather difficult. Um, 
uh, doing things like that. But we didn't think of those things. We were kids. Yeah. Um, I was, how old was I when we bought that? It was 1977. I was born in 1973 when we bought it. And I would have been 24. Yeah. So, you know, I didn't know. There was a dead tree in the backyard, which we took down by you know, tying a rope around the top of it and pulling on it till it broke. But it landed on his fence. <laughs> so that was another challenge. But we, we did start gardening from the first... Uh, well, the original garden was right behind the house. And we had to move it... Oh, well, we moved it over... T- well, it was... Yeah, it was right behind the house, kind of side to side on the lot. But then my at some point, the other neighbor, Tommy Diggs, he built this concrete, I mean this brick structure that shaded our vegetable garden. So we moved it further back. It's now at the very back of the lot. And I, it's got a fence across in front of it to keep the dog out of it. Mm-hmm. Um, we get, I'm sure there must be squirrels, rabbits. Uh, I'm not sure there haven't been deer in my yard. Find things nibbled off like this high, yeah. down to the ground. I've seen deer walking around in <laughs> Brooklyn. Yeah, you have, yeah. and you know, right across the street from me is Bunker Hill Park. So, yeah. the deer they come up from one little green patch to another. I guess I have seen just this summer. I saw a deer in the park or just leaving the park to go somewhere else two or three times. And back in those days, I mean, the idea that there could be a deer in the park. I, you might have been the first person that ever saw a deer in the park that I know of. You came home with this story that there was a deer in the park, and we just like lost our minds. We dropped everything and ran to see, but it was gone. Like that. But yeah, they're more, yeah, definitely five, more five prevalent than they used to be. What's that? Five live at the monastery. That's probably the one. Oh, they live at the monastery. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, just last week when I was walking Buster, a deer walked out of the park, right onto the lawns there below Ronald McDonald House, and disappeared between the houses. So it was probably one of the monastery deer. <laughs> it was a buck. Yeah. And he was in no hurry. Yeah. So that's pretty amazing. So yeah. I, I guess we're getting probably some deer damage too. Yeah. Um, this is probably the last year I'll have a garden. Really? Uh, I'm selling the house in the spring. I hope, God willing, if I don't burn it down over the winter. Okay. But that's the other reason why I decided to put a heating system into the house was not only to get homeowner's insurance at long last. <laughs> Uh, because that is, I said, this is your retirement, you fool. Yeah, it's uninsured. I mean, what are you going to do if it burns to the ground now? Right. So um, I want to get homeowner's insurance, but even more, I want to sell it. You know, the real estate agents told me you, you can't sell a house without central heat. You just can't. Yeah. So uh, that's happening, I hope, this fall and winter. I and will you, what will be your next... I don't know. That's why I was perking up when you mentioned communities of like-minded people in other cities. I I could go anywhere. I don't know where I'm going to go. It's kind of an exciting thought. You will probably go I'm going to go somewhere. What? You will go somewhere other than Washington, D.C. Yeah. I want to. Well, I can't afford to live in Washington, D.C. I couldn't afford this neighborhood now. No. (laughs) We were just really lucky that we bought that house when we did. Uh Um, So, yeah, now I'm going to move out of Washington. And I've been looking around. That's why I was out of town last week. I have a rental property in Binghamton, New York, which is a long story, but I went up there to look at it and think, I wonder if I could live here. Mm-hmm. I decided I couldn't. Not in that property, anyway. Mm-hmm. But uh, um, I kind of liked being up there. Something nice. It's got a nice vibe about it, Binghamton. It's kind of funky, artsy. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you've ever been there. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's on the junction of two rivers, the Susquehanna River and the Chenango River, lower, this, what they call the southern tier of New York. Mm-hmm. So it's like an hour above Scranton. Mm-hmm. Oh, the winters are hard there because they get lake effect, snow and rain, and the climate is pretty damp and cold. And I, I mean, you know, the Italian in me needs to have the sunshine. Um, I thought about moving to Mexico, but they were all horrified. Um, <laughs> Why not? You know, I was I went on vacation there to check it out, uh-huh. uh, and uh, I kind of thought I could live, but not in not in the city I went to. Which uh, city? Moralia. Mm. Nobody's ever heard of Moralia, except the Mexicans vacation there. It's a big vacation destination for Mexicans. It's not on the seashore or anything. It's it's the capital of the state of Michoacan, which is in the central highlands. It's like 
between Mexico City and the western coast. There's this, it's like 6,000 feet elevation. The climate all year long, it's like in the 50s at night and maybe low 80s in the daytime, low humidity. It's a beautiful climate. I didn't like Moralia. Mm -hmm. But there was a town nearby that I liked, uh, but my friend, who I brought with me, she didn't care for it, so mm -hmm. that's not happening. Okay. But, um, you know, they didn't want me to, they didn't even want me to go there for a week on vacation. In Mexico, you're kidding, you'll get killed. My son-in-law, he was saying, all the, here's all the Spanish you need to know. No me mata, no me mata. Don't kill me, don't kill me. Yeah, so. Um, well, that's, so that'll be a big change, though, after the, your yeah. homestead, building a homestead here in Brooklyn. It will, but you know what, I'm kind of over all this. I'm sure that wherever I live, I'm just going to have to be a little bit of yard so I can garden a little bit. Yeah. But I don't need a lot of them. Yeah. I, I really don't. And I really don't want to live in a fixer-upper anymore. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to buy like a 1990s new house. I'd like to buy something that was built in the 20s or 30s maybe. Binghamton has a lot of houses like that. And it's a depressed area. So like if you need a, an income, it would be a bad place to move. But I'm not going to need an income, am I? So I could think about living there or... Actually, today, while you were talking to Tony, I was looking at uh, rental properties in Ithaca. Mm -hmm. uh, Ithaca is a lovely, nicer place than Binghamton, I think, and it's the same climate. Yeah. But, you know, they got the colleges there. So, um, you know, I could go there. I don't know. Like I said, I'm sure I'll be gardening a little bit. Yeah. But uh, not a lot. We're... Uh, is there anything else about your life here in D.C.? Were you ever involved in the, the Brooklyn Gardeners? Who are the Brooklyn Gardeners? The, the, oh, the Garden Club here? The Garden Club, yeah. My wife joined the Garden Club when it was formed because the two people who started that were Rosie Dempsey and Jeff Wilson. Yeah. Rosie is my wife's cousin. Oh. And uh, she, I said, leave me out of it, okay? I just don't do meetings and things. No, <coughs> sorry. So we went to a couple of garden club functions the first year. They would have like potluck dinners at somebody's house or something. We did do a few of those. But I, uh, I'm, not a, I'm not a joiner. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm just really, no one who knows me would believe it, but I'm really kind of introverted when it comes to things like that. Mm -hmm. I like my own company better than me. Well, so, the Brooklyn Garden Club, yes, yeah, she did, um, and we went on some of the early house tours, which were sponsored by the garden club, aren't they? Yeah. Jeff tried to talk us into having our garden on the tour, and I said, no way, never happening. <laughs> um, and she agreed with me, actually. And I don't think she was a member of the Garden Club more than a couple of years. Maybe. Um, but uh, I think it's a great thing that there is a Garden Club. I think it's terrific. Um, although my friend Jane said she joined the Garden Club and she was disappointed. She thought she was going to learn gardening. Mm -hmm. It's not about learning gardening. Mm -hmm. But that's what she wanted in a garden club, was some place where you could actually learn gardening techniques. Mm -hmm. And I think they're missing a trick there. There's probably a lot of people who could use advice, mm -hmm. help, planning, you know, knowing what to do about this. Getting together and saying, oh, my tomatoes are all turning yellow. What's going on? Yeah. Somebody else could tell them. Yeah. Um, and that, I guess, I gather, is not what the garden club does. So there's, I think that's an unmet need yeah. there. Tell you the truth. So, yeah. yeah. The Brooklyn does look better than it used to uh -huh. uh, in terms of people planting things and improving their properties. Oh, about 15 years ago, I had some students who were looking for a place to move. They lived over, uh, I guess it's Cleveland Park, Upton Street near Wisconsin. And they wanted to move out of there. They didn't belong there. They weren't that kind of people. So I said, you should come look at Brooklyn. I think it's a great place to live. And she did. She, she they came over here and they drove around. And she said, I can't live there. There are not enough flowers. Hmm. So she felt that people were not house proud. Hmm. And um, so she didn't want to live here. And I think that that's been an improvement. You're seeing a lot more people taking care of their property and planting things and painting their houses right. and, and stuff. Um, than there used to be. So, you know, that's nice to see. And I don't know how much of this is the garden club particularly or just the type of people who are moving into Brooklyn now are more interested in doing that. Uh, you know, uh, I used to complain about lawn freaks all the time. What are they growing grass for? What the hell good is grass? You know? Uh, um, but that's what a lot of the 
I think the people who, well, like Jane on her block, this is my friend. Uh, she lives over in Woodridge on Shepherd Street. She's the only person on her entire block that has anything but grass growing in the front yard. She has a garden. It's a hillside garden. And uh, she complains about it. It's a lot of work. But and the thing is, everybody else has just got grass. But, I, you know, it was, a, an, again, it was an older, middle-class black neighborhood. And they, that's what they wanted. They wanted, like, foundation plantings and grass. Yeah. Well, now, every house that sold on her block since last year when I met her, who bought it? Young white couples. And I have a feeling they're going to start planting these pieces of grass. I really wouldn't be surprised. Hmm. So that's changing her neighborhood, too. Uh, so, yeah, we'll see. Yeah. Well, we're, we're at about an hour. Is there anything we, we didn't get to? <laughs> anything we didn't get to? <laughs> Uh, let me see. I don't know. I don't think so. Ah. No. I, I can't think of anything else that's, that I know that's interesting to tell you. Really? Can I? I mean, you weren't involved in community gardens at all. It doesn't sound No, like because we had our own property. We didn't right. need community garden space. Um. Yeah. I thought they were, and then my daughter Martha was, she was working with the, the that garden owned by Catholic U, I think she had something to do with that mm -hmm. early on, getting mm -hmm. it started, because she likes to get involved in community things, so she's doing it on Cincinnati, mm -hmm. various community things going on out there, she's a, a great believer in like urban farming and things like that, <laughs> having goats cut your front lawn, mm -hmm. there are people who do this, they, they rent goats, I know, they yeah. did it down at the Congressional Cemetery. They rented some goats to cut down all the, the ivy that was pulling down the trees. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Goats will eat poison ivy, too. I know. I think that the Park <laughs> Service needs to get some goats in there. Yeah. Uh, well, they'll eat everything else, too. They'll eat everything else, too. Well, that's true. But, you know, the poison ivy is completely out of control over there. And when I moved here, that was not a problem. My older kids played in that park all the time. But you can't go in there now. It's but like you can hardly walk through the paths because the, the park over by your house? Yeah, right. Bunker Hill Park. This summer, a group called, wait a minute, Student Conservation Association. There's a bunch of high school kids and a couple of older people. They came over there and they cleared the paths and they put down this mixture of sand and gravel on the paths. They rebuilt steps that had decayed since the Works Project Administration <laughs> under Roosevelt. You know, uh, that's the last, the Civilian Conservation Court, probably who it was, did some nice things in the park. And these people came through and they, have you been in there, Anthony? No. You can walk all the paths now that used to be blocked by fallen trees. They removed the poison ivy that was growing across the paths where you couldn't even walk through the paths. It's a lot nicer now. Nice. Yeah. Uh, so. Cool. Sounds good. I can't think of anything else. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Richard, for talking. Sure. Yeah. My pleasure. Nice to, nice to meet you. Likewise. I hope it uh, does somebody some good. Somewhere. I think it will. It's been 